crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by evil spirits, and all of them were healed. Then the high priest and all his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people the full message of this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts as they had been told and began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. So they went back and reported. We found the jail securely locked with the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priest were puzzled, wondering what would come of this. Then someone came and said, Look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts, teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. Having brought the apostles, they made them appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him when they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. There's a book you'd enjoy if you're a reader. If you're not, uh, you can get the audio version. I, I did, and it takes about 10 hours to hear it. It's called The, the Heavenly Man. It's the story of Brother Un, Brother Yoon, who actually was in Granbury last month and spoke at the Way Church, and I went to hear him having heard his story. He's an underground church pastor in prison about 10 years out of his life, on four or five different occasions, two of which he miraculously escaped, just as in this story. In his case, his angels didn't appear, but uh, the second time he was delivered from prison, he was in solitary confinement, and God told him, you got to get out of here today. They will kill you if you don't. Problem is, they broke his leg so he couldn't escape because they knew on his record he had escaped uh, two times previously, and when they arrested him, they, he tried to escape even then and fell off the second floor, jumped off the second floor and injured his feet. And so to help out the healing process, they went ahead and just broke his legs and would mock him. Let's see you get out of here now, big boy. Break his legs. And so I heard the story in the book, and he actually told it here. And this day the Lord spoke to him. He said, God, I can't. My legs are broke. And the Lord just didn't seem to understand. He just seemed to say, you got to get out of here. He looked through um, his little window to the cell across the hallway from him to another pastor that was in solitary confinement. And he said, the pastor's eyes seemed to say, you got to get out of here today. 
Well, this guy couldn't go to the bathroom without someone coming to get him and, and help him get there. So he called for someone to come get him to the, to the bathroom. They opened his door, and he hobbled out and kept hobbling uh, through open door after open door till he was standing on the street unnoticed. A cab pulls up, opens the door. He jumps in the cab and tells the cab where to go to someone's second floor apartment. He hobbles out of the cab, hobbles up to the apartment, and a little girl answers the door and says, Brother Un, we've been praying for you. Doesn't that sound familiar? He says, I need some money to pay the cab. So she gave him some money. Walking back down the steps, he realized his legs had been healed. Well, he has to live in exile from China because if they get him again, he's a dead man. Uh, maybe not the government, but the government officials that were made fools out of. Can you imagine how upset these guys were? They had the whole thing of putting Jesus to death and then the empty tomb that can't be explained. And here's guys that they arrest and they're going to have their big fuddy-duddy meeting to discuss how to threaten them to stop talking about the resurrection of Jesus and send for them and they're not even in their cell. It's got to be frustrating to the pride of man. It's interesting, though, in the, pre, in the following chapters, a great number of the priests finally become believers. Andy Duncan preached this passage two weeks ago, our missionary in uh, Berlin, Germany, and did a great job. So I'm not going to re-preach the passage, but I would like to highlight the words of the angel. On the film, you heard him say, go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. Why is it we always have to have a British accent for it to sound more official? Um, reminds me of a British comedian making fun of an American playing Robin Hood. Who played Robin Hood? Kevin Costner played Robin Hood, and they said, that's terrible. Robin Hood was British. How dare you guys do that? That's like someone from India playing Abraham Lincoln. Four score and 39 years ago, our country's fathers. Hopefully, I know that wasn't politically correct, so please forgive me, but I thought it was funny. Anyway, so the angel tells him, go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. I looked up this statement in several other translations. The basic Bible says, go take your place in the temple and give the people all the teaching of this life. The complete English Bible says, tell the people everything about this new life. The God's Word uh, paraphrase says, tell the people everything about life in Christ. The Message Bible says, tell the people everything there is to say about this life. The New Living says, give the people this message of life. The Weymouth New Testament says, go on proclaiming to the people all this message of life. They had been doing this all along, the words of this life. I'd like to speak to you today on the subject, valuable words of life. Words are important, are they not? But the words the angel is talking about here, as they're being set free, he gave them an assignment. They've been thrown in prison, told to be quiet, told to stop preaching, And um, they still did it because it was God's will. We ought to obey God rather than man, they told the leaders. And here an angel tells them to go and preach. Angels don't preach the gospel, humans do. Amen? Um, The closest an angel ever came to preaching the gospel is in two places. One where they said, he is not here, he is risen. And then there's the angel with the everlasting gospel in the book of Revelation, and I don't think that's a satellite, but anyway, I think that's an angel. But that's a whole nother topic. Peter had spoken these words of life in his first sermon on Pentecost. Having been filled with the Holy Spirit, he preaches, verse 23, that Jesus, him, being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. We preached that passage a few weeks ago. He continued proclaiming these words of life in the temple when the lame man was healed. 
A crowd gathers, wanting an explanation, and he again preaches, you deny the Holy One and the just, that's Jesus, and ask for a murderer to be granted to you, that's Barabbas, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. The cross, the burial, and the resurrection, his death and resurrected life was God dealing with our sin in such a way that our penalty is paid for and our hearts are transformed by that story. It's a sad story. It's a glorious story. It's the greatest drama of all mankind because God is out to capture the hearts of humanity, and he did it in such a way to break our hearts because of our sin. From the foundation of the world, see this cross here in the lights, the twinkly lights here. Uh, to me, that represents before the world began, Jesus was the lamb slain in the plan of God. It wasn't like, oops, we better do something here. Man has fallen into sin. No, God knew that given a choice, we would rebel in an effort to win our hearts back. There would be the cross, the death, the sacrifice, the payment for sin to redeem mankind. So you, you leave the place in time before man was even created and go forward through eons of time to the cross where Christ came and died and fulfilled what we, he was predestined to do for the sins of the world. He was set up so that every wicked thing we have ever done could be paid for. You ever had some injustice done and you can't get away from the sense of injustice and you don't know who should be punished? You know, let's say your home was violated, you were burglarized, and somebody needs to pay. Well, somebody did pay. Jesus on the cross. And through faith in that cross, we not only can be forgiven, but we can forgive others for their sins committed against us. It turns us away from our iniquities, our wickednesses. He then also preached to the priests in that same story after the healing of the lame man in chapter 4, verse 10. Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands before you made whole. And then in today's text, facing threats, these bold men did not stop. They told him we ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. And finally later, these words of life proclaimed by Peter reached the Gentile world. The non-Jewish people of the world for the first time heard the gospel of Christ's resurrection proclaimed. In Acts 10, Peter says, We are witnesses of all these things, which he, meaning Jesus, did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly. This event was done in the capital of a province of the Roman Empire, in the land of Israel, the land of Judea, the land of Palestine. Son of God came and was publicly executed. And it was a public knowledge. Word went through the known world of his resurrection. The words of this life were spread. So the proclaiming of Christ's risenness, his resurrection, is for more than just one day a year. It's the gospel for every day, amen? What are these valuable words? They are the good news of the resurrection. To put it simply, they are Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. I read a story years ago back during the days of Russian oppression in Eastern Europe that on Easter Sunday in some village somewhere there was an atheistic speech. And all the townspeople had to come hear this atheist, communistic leader rant and rave and stomp and foam at the mouth about the realities of atheism and how 
the resurrection of Christ is impossible could never have happened. When he was done, an old man back in the crowd in their language said, Christ is risen! And the whole crowd said, He is risen indeed. <laughs> Can we do that today? Christ is risen! He is risen indeed. What if I told you death is not final? That when the heart stops, eternity starts. That your last breath is just the beginning. That the grave is not the end. What if I told you death loses? Our faith is not blind. It is not without evidence. Josephus recorded um, the fact of the resurrection story in his writings. We have several elements in this story that give us reason to believe. Number one is the execution. Well, how does that play into this? Well, if he didn't die, there would be no resurrection, right? He was killed publicly. He was slain professionally by people who knew what they were doing. The theory of him swooning or fainting on the cross wasn't around for centuries till later. Surely if that had happened, someone would have piped up and offered that as a reason for the empty tomb. The enemies who wanted him killed, who wanted him wiped out, did not want a fake resurrection because he had prophesied, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. He also said, as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. So they kept the crime scene pure. No one was able to contaminate or tamper with the evidence in this case. They had Roman guards 24-3 <laughs> to keep the, keep the uh, thing from being stolen, the body from being stolen. The, the stone, which no doubt weighed hundreds of pounds, was sealed with a Roman seal. It was a cord that would make it a crime to break that cord that was tied around a nail or a spike in the wall. And at the tomb, that spike is sheared off and tests have been run on it, and it is iron from that day and time. Who knows where the stone is? No doubt that's been used somewhere else, but the nail is still there. So the enemies give us assurance to believe that there could be no fake resurrection. They didn't want a fake one. They wanted to end his influence. That's why they, all they could do was threaten. They didn't present a body, they didn't point, oh, they went to the wrong tomb. Well, they would, have, they would have surely caught that if that was the case. Hey, you guards are at the wrong place. Then, of course, there's the reality of the empty tomb that was a short walk from the temple. Unexplainable. Something happened. Then there are his eyewitnesses. We appeared to dozens and hundreds. One place the Bible says he appeared to 500 people at once. There's their testimony, some of which we have recorded in the Scripture, written testimony, which is admissible in any court of law. Eyewitness testimony stands even in our day. There's the empowered followers who were fearful, scared of their shadow, denied that they even knew him, refusing to believe unless they, you know, put their hands in his wounds that became empowered believers through the infilling of the Holy Spirit and the resurrection story. They knew he was risen. They were willing to die for it, and under torture, none of them recanted that. 
There's this engaged family. There's plenty of people that fall off the the rails and have followers, you know, drink Kool-Aid when they tell them to, but rarely do their families go along with it. His family became believers. Two of his brothers, James and Jude, wrote books in the New Testament. There's the enraged religions. Now, a religion sometimes is formed around a government which becomes a career for people. You had Sadducee Judaism, you had Pharisaical Judaism, you had ceremonial Judaism, you had the Essenes, you had Romanism, the Roman uh, emperor's worship, you had pagans. Throughout this book, these people rising up, fighting the story of the resurrection because they were losing business, losing income, right? You're messing with my pension. Even though they would kill believers and torture them, the resurrection story continued to spread. The words of this life continued to be proclaimed as the angel told Peter. In 313 A.D., the Emperor Constantine issued the Edict of Milan, which accepted Christianity. Ten years later, Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire. And it's been debated ever since. Was that a good thing or was it not a good thing? The fact is it happened. After three centuries of fighting the resurrection story, they began proclaiming it. Undeniable fact in history. In fact, history has been engraved because of the resurrection, the way history is measured. We live in 2017 A.D. A.D. doesn't stand for after death. It stands for Anno Domino, which means the time of the Lord's reign. Anno is related to the word annual, time, year. Domino relates to the word dominate or lordship. The time of the Lord's reign begins with his life continuing onward. This would not be the case were it not for the resurrection. Oh, I know your history books of school now record, you know, we live in 2017 CE, which stands for Common Era. But so what? Why is it CE? Same thing, because of the resurrection. This evidence that we've looked at just briefly, and this isn't all of it, still stands after 20 centuries, stands to be wrestled with. In the theaters right now is a film called The Case for Christ, and it's a story of Lee Strobel, who as a reporter for the Chicago Tribune came home one day to discover his wife had become a believer in Jesus. And using his journalistic skills and university training, he set out to debunk Christianity and ran into the resurrection story. Make a long story short, he became a believer himself and is a great apologist for the faith and has written books that are all over the world. The evidence remains, and the results of that evidence endures because faith in this resurrection turns our hearts away from iniquity. You may be living in your iniquities, you may be wallowing in your sin, but you're not happy doing it because you know Christ paid for your sins and has risen from the dead to help lead and guide you through his lordship to victory in every area of your life. This question comes around every year at this time. Churches are blessed by people that don't normally go. It's like a crossroads day. Hey, Easter celebrators, the goddess Ishtar is no more. Her holiday's been trashed. Jesus rose from the dead on that day. You can eat candy and, you know, boil eggs and chase rabbits all you want to, but Christ is risen. And what will you do with the risen Christ? He died for you. He arose from the dead for you. The question is yours. Will you step up to the plate? and put your life in his hands and begin to pursue a relationship with him. The cross is a call. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I have paid for your sin. And the resurrection is assurance that he paid. If 
he was only born, he would only have empathy for humanity. If he only died, then Satan and sin would have the victory. But he rose from the dead so that we could have more than empathy, but so that we could have victory through redemption on the cross. So you're at the crossroads today. Will you call on him? Let's bow our heads. Lord, I pray for every person in this room. For those that are following you, I pray, Lord, you'd make us bolder witnesses than ever because of the resurrection. For those that have not been following you, have never followed you, or gotten off track from following you, I pray, Lord, that your calling would be really clear to them and that this day would not end without them calling out to you. Can everybody look at me? I want to lead us in a prayer. And if you find yourself believing what I have proclaimed, pray this prayer with us. Because it's impossible to believe unless God gives you the grace to believe. And if you find yourself believing the proclamation of the good news, these words of life, Christ's resurrection, that is called saving faith. The Bible says that salvation comes when we confess with our mouth what we believe in our heart. So let's take that next step from believing in your heart. Now let's confess with our mouth. Pray with me. Jesus, I call on your name and ask you to save me. I believe you died for my sins and I believe you're risen from the dead. Although I don't understand it, I believe. Help my unbelief. If you prayed that from your heart, don't leave here today without telling someone, hey, I, I prayed the prayer with the preacher. Can you pray with me some more? To do that, the Christian life isn't made to be lived by yourself. It's made to be lived in community with other believers, and we're here. So don't waste this opportunity to do that. Can we do that? Let's stand. the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance to you, not turn his back on you, and give you his peace. And may you live in the hope of the resurrection. And I say that to everybody. You know, let's imagine two people are hired by the same company to do the same job, and one person is told this job pays 30 grand a year. The other person is told, don't tell anybody, but this job pays 30 grand a year, plus you're going to get a $150,000 bonus at the end of your first year. Which person is going to have the best attitude over that job? Which person is going to be least likely to whine and complain? the person with hope in their hearts. Get your hopes up. A better day is coming. The resurrection gives us assurance of that. Amen. Go get them, tigers. Thank you for worshiping with us today.